there's been a lot in prostate cancer over the last, uh, so even last year. And um, the thing about castrate-resistant and castrate-sensitive disease is that we've been moving up our treatments earlier in the course of, of the overall uh, disease process. And now we're giving androgen deprivation therapy, as we saw in the talks from yesterday, with other agents such as abiraterone, docetaxel, plus or minus darolutamide, enzalutamide, apalutamide. These are all used in the upfront setting. So clearly this is going to have a downstream effect on what you do when a patient becomes castrate resistant. Do you try another hormone? Do you go right to chemotherapy? Do you go to plevicto? Do you give CYPT as a particular treatment? How do we sequence these particular treatments in uh, the patient's oral regimen? Remember that the androgen receptor is still present. 90% of human tumor specimens from prostate cancer patients will still have an androgen receptor. And the way patients become resistant includes mutations of that androgen receptor, aberrant splicing, or intracrine synthesis of androgen, as we saw yesterday or the other day. Jack Geller was one who originally described that in 1969, where there are elevated intracellular testosterone levels, and these are, are, are some of the ways that patients become resistant. So I like to group the treatments in classes of treatment, immunotherapeutic treatments, such as CYP2T, and we'll talk about pembrolizumab because it does have a role, and when it works, it's dramatic. Other hormonal agents, apalutamide, enzalutamide, uh, darolutamide, cytotoxic agents such as docetaxel, cabazitaxel, and then agents that damage DNA such as radium-223. Pluvicto actually works by the particular mechanism, olaparib and rucaparib. And also we have to think about molecular markers. Immune markers such as microsatellite instability, the androgen receptor, ARV7 does come into play as well, and then markers of DNA repair. We also like to look at our patients in terms of their symptoms, are they symptomatic versus asymptomatic? Where is the disease? Is it visceral, bone, or non-visceral? Are they pre and post docetaxel? This is sort of going away. And then what was used in the hormone-sensitive state versus now in the castrate-resistant state? Looking at molecular markers, uh, prostate cancer presents a unique problem where most of the disease is in the bone. And uh, we are now beginning to use liquid biopsies, circulating tumor cells, plasma, uh, as well as imaging uh, with PSMA, and we cover that very well in this particular meeting, uh, to help determine whether patients should be treated. This is a very, very important thing that should not be missed in any castrate-resistant prostate cancer patient, microsatellite instability. This is from a study from Memorial where they took 1,033 patients who had adequate tumor specimens. 23 of those patients, or 2.2%, had tumors that were high in MSI sensor scores. And uh, of those, uh, six patients had more than one tumor analyzed, and this actually developed over time. Uh, microsatellites or, or uh, DNA, um, uh, or at least this, this measures the stability of the genome and tells us whether there may be immune antigens that, be, that could be, potentially become present. Well, if you give pembrolizumab to these patients, you see about a 50% response rate, and some of these responses are fairly durable. And uh, this is one of the indications for pembrolizumab. It's FDA approved. It was the first drug that got a pan-tumor approval for this microsatellite marker. So every tumor, every prostate cancer patient needs to be checked for microsatellite instability. We use abiraterone and enzalutamide in the upfront settings. We know that there's cross-resistance between these and generally about 10 to 20% of uh, patients who are treated with Abbey after Enza or Enza after Abbey have a response, but this is generally short, about three to four months. And so there is evidence of cross-resistance. In fact, taxanes are probably a little bit less effective after Abbey and Enza. And there are a variety of different ways which we can become resistant. As I pointed out before, the androgen receptor is, is the key here, but also what I'm going to focus on next is some of these different variants or splice variants of the androgen receptor, particularly the T878A. So we've been working at Yale with a compound called uh, ARV110, which is unique in that it's a protac. It's one of the first protacs to be used in cancer treatment. And what a protac is, is it uses the natural uh, ability of the body to degrade proteins and it accelerates it. So ARV110 will bind to the androgen receptor using the E3 ligase pathway, you, and be, it will become ubiquinated, and the proteasome will chew it up. So this is a way of specifically targeting the androgen receptor. It's not antagonizing binding. It's not going to affect testosterone, but it will affect the, um, uh, the, the, the amount of androgen receptor present. 
What we found with ARV110 is that it does affect, in the laboratory, the T878X and the H875Y uh, variant uh, of the androgen receptor. These are, will cause uh, more activity of the androgen receptor. And uh, this is a phase two trial that we presented at ASCO GU last year, uh, last year. And what we found was that there were responses. Response rate was 46% in patients who were harboring these particular mutations. And aside from that, um, we did see soft tissue responses in these patients. Two of seven patients had a soft tissue response as well. So this is moving forward. There will be phase three trials designed along this, but because we've exhausted abiraterone and enzalutamide, that doesn't mean that we still can't affect the androgen receptor. Uh, this is important to note as well. The Tropic study uh, uh, was the registration trial that got cabazitaxel approved as a second line agent after docetaxel. As we see, there's a modest improvement in overall survival with cabazitaxel compared to mitazantron and prednisone, which was the default standard of care at that time. How do we sequence these drugs? Well, this is the same concept I was talking about before. Should we give a taxane after failing a taxane or abirater and abiraterone, or should we go ahead with another antiandrogen? So the CARD trial was run by Ron DeWitt, and what he found was in this randomized study that there was an improved progression-free survival for cabazitaxel and an improved overall survival for cabazitaxel compared to the alternate antiandrogen. So basically, you have evidence here that switching antiandrogens is not going to work. You're better off going to chemotherapy. Uh, we saw a presentation at this meeting looking at rucaparib as an agent for those patients who have uh, DNA repair mutations. This reminds us that about uh, 10 to 20 percent of patients will harbor these mutations, predominantly BRCA1, BRCA2. And this is the summary data, 11 percent in seven studies that looked at these DNA repair mutations. We know that Olaparib had initial activity in the Toparp study where they looked at 49 patients with castrate-resistant disease who had received docetaxel. About a third of these responded uh, in the unselected group, but when you looked at DNA repair mutations, uh, 14 of the 16 patients responded, or only two of the 33 who did not have DNA repair mutations responded. So the, a profound trial looked at Olaparib in patients who had received a prior antiandrogen uh, and who had, progressed in, uh, had disease progression. There were two cohorts, those who had BRCA or ATM, and then all the other DNA repair mutations. Uh, as we see here, uh, there were 16 that were looked at overall, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and 28% uh, had alterations in one or more of those genes from the overall population that was screened. As we see from the profound study, the RPFS, which is the primary endpoint, was superior in cohort A, that's the BRCA patients, plus ATM, uh, by about four months. And uh, if we look at both cohorts, it's a little bit less, it's about two months overall, but nonetheless significant improvement. We see that the ones who tend to benefit the most are the, uh, the BRCAs. The ATM is not, not as good, and the PPR2 or two or two A's uh, really do not do as well with, with the PARP inhibitors, and uh, those are smaller subgroups. Uh, but there was an improvement in overall survival by about three months for uh, Olaparib compared to best standard of care. We have to keep in mind that these drugs have toxicities, including anemia, nausea, fatigue. Uh, you have to check their blood counts at least on a monthly basis, and um, the most common interruption is due to anemia. You can dose reduce or uh, whole doses, uh, but generally it's a very well tolerated drug. So where are we going in the future with the PARP inhibitors? Uh, how can we improve the overall response rate? We see from this particular slide that there is a synergy between uh, co-targeting the androgen receptor uh, as well as uh, the DNA damage repair pathways. And in fact, if uh, this is from uh, xenografts, from the control compared to castration or castration plus the PARP inhibitors, uh, that seems to do overall the best uh, compared to the single agents alone. Uh, and the thought is, is that, that the uh, androgen receptor will, uh, will uh, uh, target the PARP, uh, tar tar PARP genes, there's tr transcriptional downregulation of the androgen targets, and you're inducing brackiness. We've actually tried this at Yale. Uh, we actually published this this year, looking at anti-angiogenesis agents as well. Um, and we found that, that, that there was an improvement, but it was predominantly uh, dominated by the BRCA patients. So the MAGNITUDE trial looked at niraparib combined with abiraterone. 
uh, compared to uh, abiraterone uh, alone in patients. And this was pre-planned, looking at the HRR-positive patients as well as the HRR-negative patients. So BRCA1 mutated the primary endpoint, was met. Uh, there was an improvement in radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, this combination reduced the risk of progression or death by 47% compared to uh, abiraterone prednisone alone. And we see also that uh, by central review, the RPFS was better. Um, and this, this was all the positive patients by the primary endpoint. And that was by the investigative assessment. Uh, same thing, BRCA1, BRCA2s, but the, the negative patients did not have an improvement in uh, overall uh, RPFS. So this is telling us that at least for these patients it, with this combination of drugs that uh, it, it doesn't really seem to have an effect on the wild type, but it does have an effect on the mutated. And this again is looking particularly at the BRCA when a pre-specified subgroup analyses that seem to show the most consistency. Now we have the PROPEL trial, which also tested a similar concept, Alaprib and abiraterone versus placebo and abiraterone as first-line therapy for patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. It's important to note that both of these trials are taking abiraterone as a first-line treatment of castrate-resistant disease, and they did not permit patients to have, who have had these agents in the hormone-sensitive state. So that's a big question with both of these trials. How do we apply this overall to our, our clinical practice? I think really what needs to be done is a trial that continues the, the abiraterone as the PARP inhibitor, uh, but that I think, you know, this is the data that we have at this particular point, and it was dependent upon what the standard of care was at that time. So this was, uh, these were patients who were permitted to have docetaxel in the hormone-sensitive state. They could not have prior abiraterone, and they were randomized to receive olaparib combined with abiraterone uh, versus placebo combined with abiraterone. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. And uh, this is by investigator assessment. Uh, these are all patients. We see that there's improvement in RPFS uh, by about eight months uh, with the combination therapy. And if we start looking at the uh, status of the patients in terms of their DNA repair mutations, as one would expect, uh, the hazard ratio is better for those who are mutated. Uh, and uh, we see a different trend here. Uh, there is a, uh, an improvement in overall uh, progression-free survival for those patients who are non-mutated. So again, I think that, that, that uh, this is very, very interesting data and has applications to our practice. I believe it's in front of the FDA for approval, uh, but, um, but again, we need to, to, to consider this in terms of our patients in terms of their overall states of disease. We've heard a lot about Pluvicto. I don't recall that we had any actual presentation of the data uh, from the vision trial. Uh, but lutetium PSMA is a conjugate that will recognize PSMA expression. That's in about 90% of castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients. So the VISION trial basically took patients who had received at least one angiogen receptor pathway inhibitor, one or two taxane treatments, and these patients were randomized to lutetium PSMA uh, versus a protocol committed standard of care alone. So this arm is a little bit interesting from the standpoint that it could be abiraterone or enzalutamide, uh, could not be chemotherapy from what I uh, looked at the data. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, th there is some question as to whether this should have been used as a control arm. In fact, there's some question as to whether this should be used as a control arm in the future. Uh, two to one ra ra randomization, and this is what I mentioned before. Not all patients are gonna be eligible to receive this. 87% of patients scanned met the criteria by uh, PSMA PET scanning uh, to be on this trial. 1,079 screened, uh, 1,003 were positive, and then eventually 82.9% were randomized. Now, there were two different groups of patients because of some issues with data. There was the RPFS analysis set, and then the all randomized patients. And uh, as we see here, they're fairly well uh, balanced in terms of sites of disease. 12% uh, of patients having disease in liver, predominantly good performance status, ECOG 0 or 1. So this is the primary endpoint, uh, all randomized patients, uh, overall survival, hazard ratio of 0 0.62, 15.3 versus 11.3 months. And, uh, you know, again, this is, this is I think, uh, uh, impressive data. And then uh, in the RPFS set, which is the one that was used for the FDA approval, very, very similar, 14.6 versus 10.4 months. And again, we start looking at the different groups. Practically everything 
uh, favors uh, uh, the uh, lutetium PSMA arm, except for uh, Asian ancestry, and that's probably because the number is extremely low uh, for these patients. Um, this again is the primary analysis RPFS showing an improvement in overall uh, RPFS by about five months. And then for the OS analysis set, uh, again, uh, about a five month improvement. So the FDA has approved uh, Pluvicto for the treatment of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer in those patients who have had one to two prior antiangiogen treatments as well as prior chemotherapy. It's not yet approved for those patients who, have, who are chemotherapy naive, and I know that a lot of our patients are asking that question, but uh, I encourage uh, those in the audience to enter patients on trials that may uh, go forth with this. So we've covered a lot in this short period of time. The important thing is that all of these patients need to be molecularly profiled before their uh, overall uh, journey on the castrate resistant disease front. So we need to test for MSI, mutational burden, which also may be related to immune therapy, and DDR mutations. Checkpoint emission therapy is appropriate for that small percentage of patients who have microcidal instability. It is not appropriate for anybody else outside of a clinical trial. PARP inhibition is appropriate for those patients with DNA repair mutations. It's effective. We have two FDA-approved agents, Rucaparib, which was covered uh, pr previously, as well as uh, Olaparib. And it does seem that, uh, that this is predominantly BRCA. The ATM mutations don't seem to work as well. And um, lutetium is also approved by the FDA for patients with castrate-resistant disease.